Ah yes, the Paper Mario series. Started back on the Nintendo 64, the first two games in the series are fantastic. They're very basic in terms of actual gameplay, some of the simplest RPGs you'll find out there, while still being nuanced enough to be fun. They ain't like Mystic Quest, that's for sure. Action Command battles that kept you engaged, a cast of quirky sidekicks that could help you clear obstacles, and each had advantages and disadvantages in combat. And the games had some of the most humorous writing I've ever seen in any Mario game before or since. However, because Nintendo didn't think it would be a good idea to have two Mario RPG series going simultaneously, the Mario and Luigi series continued being the more traditional RPG games, while they decided that the Paper Mario series should become some sort of weird, experimental series, without anything aside from the artistic aesthetic to recommend it. This has led to the divisive, to put it mildly, Sticker Star, and the slightly less divisive Color Splash, even those that like those two games tend to agree that, in comparison to The Thousand Year Door, these games are pretty big disappointments. But, in between Thousand Year Door and Sticker Star, there was one other game bearing the paper moniker that was released, often overlooked in conversation of the series, but obviously the start of the series drift away from its RPG roots. That game is Super Paper Mario, and unlike Sticker Star, pretty much everyone who has played that game tends to agree that it's still a good, fun game. It's just how far removed it is from the Paper Mario series that tends to get people in a tizzy when they bring it up. This game was released relatively early in the Wii's lifespan, but would go on to be a confirmed hit, and would be one of the first Mario titles to be released on the system, after New Super Mario Bros, but before Mario Galaxy. It is an interesting title to be sure, and thankfully the game is starting to gain a bit more recognition as time goes on, for its quality as people judge it a bit more on its own merits rather than in comparison to the games that came before. So what exactly is the story of this game? Well, much like Thousand Year Door that came before it, it's a bit more robust than your typical Mario story. Princess Peach has been kidnapped, once again, as you do, but this time it isn't Bowser who is responsible. Instead, a villain known as Count Black is responsible, and he no sooner reveals this to Mario and co than he kidnaps Bowser and all of his minions too. Mario is whisked away to another dimension by a small butterfly creature known as Tippy, a creature referred to as a pixel that seems to be able to travel between different dimensions. As it turns out, the reason Black wanted Bowser and Peach was so that he could force the two of them to get married, since this union, according to an evil book known as the Dark Prognosticus, will tear a void in the fabric of space-time that will slowly expand and consume absolutely everything it comes in contact with. But, of course, a book known as the Light Prognosticus states that a group of heroes will stop it by gathering seven MacGuffins known as the Pure Hearts. And so Mario, assisted by Tippy, must travel through several dimensional gates to different worlds, gather up all of the Pure Hearts, find the other three heroes, and put an end to Count Black's evil scheme. If this is sounding pretty bog standard, it's because it honestly is pretty close to the setup of the first two games with the seven Star Spirits and the seven Crystal Stars. It certainly gives us a bit more of a gut punch with not only the world but the entire universe at stake, but you could be forgiven for thinking that we're going on a similar adventure here. But honestly, all things considered, while it starts off as your typical Mario adventure, things quickly get a bit more complex. And dark. And just a little bit scary. I mean, don't get me wrong, this is still Mario, so it's not like things get so bad you couldn't show it to a child, but this story takes some surprisingly dramatic turns as you go through it. Each chapter generally is its own self-contained story, with bits and pieces that link it to the overarching plot, but the game really throws you for a loop around chapter 6 or so. Up to this point, the story has been pretty Mario-esque, with some jumping into silly territory and some hinting at some more serious stuff in the background, but come chapter 6, you see firsthand exactly what happens to a world overtaken by the Void. And without giving anything away, I'll just say that it has probably one of the most emotionally charged endings you'll ever find in a Mario game. And it is one of the biggest reasons why the lack of anything resembling an actual story in Sticker Star bothered me so much. Thousand Year Door had an actually really fun story in it, and this game took it up a notch by managing to blend the really funny and humorous writing with dramatic and emotional story beats that I never expected to see in anything with Mario in the title. 
Oh yeah, the humor is great too, especially early in the game, and even when things start to get a bit more serious, the game never loses its sense of tongue-in-cheek humor. Mario still emotes mostly through expressions and silly gestures, the characters that you encounter throughout your journey are delightfully quirky and full of personality, and of course Mario's companions have plenty to say about the situations as well. Yet, yeah, once again, Mario is joined on his journey by some partners, but rather than being original characters this time around, he's joined by Luigi, Peach, and even Bowser, and they all get a moment to shine, both in the story and in gameplay. And speaking of gameplay, that's where things start to get a bit interesting. Like I mentioned before, this was the first game to stray from the established formula of the first two Mario games. Those two games were turn-based RPGs with large 3D worlds to explore. This game is a 2D puzzle platformer with 3D exploration and RPG elements mixed in. You start the game with just Mario and the ability to do what he does best, jump on stuff. It's standard platforming fare, and every time you jump on an enemy or collect a disposable item, you gain points, which act as your experience. When your points pass a certain threshold, you level up, which will permanently raise either your health by 5 points or your attack by 1 point. Soon enough, however, Mario gains the ability to flip, basically allowing him to temporarily flip the entire world from 2D to 3D. This not only allows you to find new items, but is necessary throughout the game to solve puzzles and locate hidden paths forward. Throughout the game, you also gain new helpers in the form of new pixels, each possessing their own special ability and expanding your arsenal. Thoreau, for example, allows you to pick up and throw enemies and objects, while Boomer acts a lot like the bob characters from past games, able to explode and open new paths and damage nearby enemies. You gain them naturally as you go throughout the story, but you can also find hidden pixels as rewards for going back to older areas and thoroughly exploring them. Peach, Bowser, and Luigi also bring their own twist to the formula as well, and each have unique abilities that are needed to get past certain points of the game. Luigi possesses a mean super jump that allows him to launch up into the air, and can be used as a projectile attack against enemies. Peach can use her parasol to not only float over long stretches of nothingness, but she can also use it as a shield to defend her from almost anything approaching her from the side or from above. Bowser's an interesting case. Not only does he come equipped with fire breath, which makes him very useful in early underwater areas, but he always has double the attack of the other three characters. See, all of the characters share the same health bar, experience, and three of four of them share the same attack amount. Bowser, however, will always have twice the attack of the other characters, making him an absolute bruiser in any situation. Pretty much all of your character's actions and pixel powers can be used to both solve puzzles and attack enemies, some of which even do more damage than others. The structure of the game in terms of progression is pretty different from the first two games as well. Rather than being one giant world with different large hub areas you visit, you have one large hub area known as Flipside. Every time you use a pure heart, you open a new world to explore, to start a new chapter, and each chapter is divided into four separate stages, with the last stage usually ending in a boss fight. In between chapters, you're generally tasked with finding a pure heart pillar hidden somewhere in town, placing the pure heart upon it, and opening up the door to the next chapter. Unfortunately, this is where one of the biggest criticisms of the game comes from, and it's one I can't really refute. This game can get very... Very slow sometimes. And most of that is on these in between chapter segments, where you have to explore Flipside and place the pure hearts. These segments stretch on for way too long, especially since, in most situations, you're forced to find and explore an entirely new area of Flipside with every new chapter. And Flipside, as it turns out, is way bigger than is necessary. Right at the start of the game, you do get an item that can warp you right back to the top of the tower from anywhere else in the game if you need it, but there's not really a way to easily fast travel around the rest of town, and due to its layout, getting around can be a bit of a hassle. You can get used to it, I mean you're kind of required to with how much running around the town you do over the course of the game, but it does feel rather needlessly expansive at times. Again, especially when you're hunting for the Crystal Heart Pillars. The actual levels themselves can move pretty slowly depending on what is expected of you. There's a good chunk of levels that are just straightforward get to the end affairs, but there are just as many that are more explorative, puzzle-based areas. 
Chapter 2 is an excellent example of this, where you have to find a fortune teller inside a massive mansion. The first level is straightforward platforming as you make your way through a swamp area to the mansion proper, but the next three levels are all based around puzzle solving and a mystery of some kind. Level 2 has you trying to work out which is the right room to take without being tricked by Mimi and ending up in one of her traps. Level 3 sees you try to find a way to pay off a million ruby debt by having to do slave labor and finding a way to break into a giant vault. Also, when I say slave labor, I really do mean it. You're stuck doing things like this for most of the episode. I always wish to win, keep running to the end, make a move and stay one step ahead, stay back and watch me go the only way I know, cause nothing's gonna slow me down. And the last level of Chapter 2 has you being chased by an invincible Mimi who does this freaky crap. while you're trying to find your way through a large maze to find the fortune teller who eventually helps you to enter a boss fight against her. It's a pretty clever setup that keeps the game from getting old. This is especially important because of how the platforming works in the game, because it's not... well, it's not bad, but it definitely is not the best platforming I've seen. It's hard to describe, but it feels unusually floaty when you're jumping, like the gravity is lower in this game. As a consequence, the impact doesn't really register that well when you hit an enemy. There's nothing wrong with the hitboxes or anything, but it just doesn't feel that satisfying to hit enemies, nor does it feel like it has much impact when you take damage. The control itself feels a bit weird, like they were trying to retain a control scheme similar to the RPGs while making a few minor tweaks to make it better for platforming. It's easy enough to get used to, but if you're the sort of person who's used to Mario controlling a certain way, then this is going to be a bit of an adjustment. The music in the game is also a lot of fun, but it's also something that I only really remember a short time after playing. The major exceptions being the flip side theme, because you're going to hear that more than anything else, the first level theme, because it's a remix of the original Mario theme pushed through a bunch of synthesizers falling out of a plane, and the remixed version of the invincibility theme when you grab a mega mushroom because it just sounds so damn badass. <laughs> But most of the rest of the music doesn't really stay with me. It's definitely got that Nintendo polish all over it, so none of it is bad, but none of it really sticks with you the way the other Mario themes do, and that's a bit of a shame. The art style is pretty good too, being bright and colorful, but rather than focus on the whole paper gimmick like they did with Thousand Year Door, they instead turn their attention to lines and pixels. Each world has a bit of a distinct flavor to it. While yes, the first two Paper Mario games also possessed very different looking areas, they were unified by their overall art style. In Super Paper Mario, almost every area feels very far removed from the others in terms of its looks and the people who inhabit those areas. And while I can say that the environments and perspective tricks the game uses for the 2D to 3D gimmick all look really good, I never found the original characters in the game, the placeholder characters like the villagers in Flipside, to be that visually appealing. They're just a jumble of geometric shapes, really. They look way too, pardon the expression, flat for my tastes. And yes, this is a Wii game, and what would a Wii game be without shoehorned motion controls? I'll tell you what it'd be. It'd be a GameCube game. Luckily, Super Paper Mario does not have many instances of having to shake or point your controller, but it does come up often enough to break up the flow of certain levels, and the main mechanic behind it is so blasé that it really makes you wonder why they even bothered. And then you remember, Wii game. They probably didn't have a choice in the matter. Yes, there are a couple of mini-games that have you tilting and shaking and pointing, but those are totally optional, and are actually kind of fun, even if the motion controls are totally bolted to them without reason. No, the main mechanic when it comes to motion controls is pointing it at the screen to have Tippy tell you about various objects, characters, and enemies on screen. Basically the equivalent of the Goomba party members in the first two games. Alright, you say, well then I just won't use that ability. And yes, you can safely ignore it when it comes to the environments and enemies, and most of what you need to do is pretty obviously spelled out by the designs, positions, or by other characters, but you also need to point at the screen to have Tippy reveal hidden platforms and doors that are otherwise invisible. 
And it's frustrating because, once again, it doesn't come up often enough to make the mechanic seem worth including, but it comes up often enough that it feels more like an annoyance than a fun gameplay mechanic. Luckily though, it's a minor blemish on what is otherwise a perfectly fine game. Is it perfect? No, far from it, and when the game first came out, I was, like many others, a little put off by the genre shift away from traditional RPG mechanics. But the game, I feel, has been vindicated by history. Its major issues, that being the pacing of the story and the pillar hunting segments, are legitimate problems one can have with it, but are far from something that would ruin the entire game. And those that manage to stick out the slow beginning and actually get into the game proper will discover a rather fun and surprisingly emotional journey through tons of different worlds with plenty of humor and some really interesting and varied challenges. And if you're one of those people who didn't like the game when it first came out, I think it's worth giving another look. Who knows, your opinion might have changed. I give Super Paper Mario, blemishes and all, a very high recommendation.